We still have a few people logging in, so I'm just going to give you a minute or two to get settled and then we'll get underway. Mm -hmm. Looking forward. A couple more seconds while people log in. It's kind of normal time for lecture, you just have to wait a couple of minutes. <laughs> exactly. Okay. All right, I think we'll get started. So, hello everybody. My name's Beth, and welcome to our in session talk today. We have over 350 people uh, from 25 countries registered to join us today. Today's subject is designing transformation for the planet. Before I introduce you to our esteemed speakers, Laura and Henk, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and we'll share the recording on our event page at some point next week. Please use the chat button if you have any technical difficulties regarding the webinar, um, we can help you. Uh, we invite you to ask questions by using the Q&A button. You can upvote the questions that you like the most and any remaining unanswered questions, we'll try to get our speakers to answer and make them available on our event page. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speakers. I'm gonna hand you over to Laura and Henk who are going to start today's conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bethany. So welcome to this in-session talk on the sun and transformation for the planets with Hank Kovic, who is the Special Envoy for International Water Affairs and Kingdom of the Netherlands Sherpa to the High Level Panel on Water. My name is Laura Ferrarello. I am the MRS Design Pathway Leader and also like Senior Tutor in the School of Design. And we are very indeed very delighted to have Hank to, uh, with us uh, this evening um, because uh, like uh, in this uh, in, uh, in session talks where we used to question what role art and design can have in tackling complex issues like the one we're facing at the moment. And what we are focusing on at the moment this evening in particular is about the planets and discuss what contribution design can give to develop opportunities able to leverage current and future strategies that align, with, uh, that align society with the planet and its needs. And Hank indeed has been, has having a key role in advising governments around the world. And in particular, he served on President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force, where, um, where he led the long-term innovation, resilience and rebuilding effort. And from this, he created the Rebuild by Design Architectural Competition and initiated the National Disaster Resilience Competition. Rebuild by Design is indeed a very good example and, and Hank indeed demonstrated how people can be an asset of change and transformation that account for local communities' needs as well as the environmental challenges. And Hank in his work deploys the opportunities that people's skills and, exp and expertise can develop when collaborating with environments for creating economies, places and generally social relationships that are aware and understand that it's better to have the planet on our side. And indeed, Hank has been using design to develop strategies to show that it's possible to be knowledge and expertise following natural laws. And today, indeed, we are kind of, we would like to hear from you, Hank, how what role design can have in addressing complex issues to foster transformation, adaptation, resilience, and above all opportunities. So Hank, uh, over to you. Do you want to co continue or shall I go for the first question? No, no, I think Laura, uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's an honor, uh, RCA. Uh, thanks so much for organizing this. But uh, let's uh, immediately um, uh, do a deep dive. You, you right. said more about me than I will, would ever want to dare to say. So please go ahead. <laughs> right. So I'll go with the first question. So uh, from your experience, could you describe what are the most urgent challenges we need to address to unlock strategies to develop social economical transformation that are climate friendly? And then what kind of, what are these? What do you think are kind of human led and kind of planet led? What do you think? It's a, it's a challenging question. Eh? You send it to me. So I've been thinking about this a bit uh, because um, it feels like on one hand, uh, it is really about what are the hurdles uh, that we have to overcome uh, mm -hmm. in the context of uh, climate change. Because eh? uh, there is no doubt around the world that climate change is happening, that we are, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, part of uh, why it's, why it's happening, uh, actually causing it, uh, for most of it. 
uh, we see it in how we could change from a mitigation or origination perspective, and we can also see how we can better adapt. So more or less that that is clear, although that understanding, it's very complex, that understanding still has to increase. But it, you know, and in 2015, so that's five years ago, we agreed on a, a, a Paris Agreement, and in the Paris Agreement we said two degrees is max, uh, at post-industrial levels, uh, 1.5 degree would be better. So there's also a target, eh? and this was a, an agreement by national governments, but underwritten by private sector, investors, cities, uh, and across. So you could almost say, if we, if we, if we know eh, climate change is real and threatening, if we see disasters of more floods, droughts, uh, and health issues increase because of climate change, and we set a target, why isn't it happening? Then you have to think about all the hurdle, hurdles. So can't we do it? Eh? Is it only because of vested interests? So that is then the uh, 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 people focused. And that is uh, partially true. Uh, our vested interests prevent us from the change we see. So that means that although we know uh, what we need to know, we know what the challenges are, our, our, our vested interests prevent us for, from that change. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, um, why can't we escape these vested interests? Because we look at the short term. Mm -hmm. uh, every investment we look at uh, is, um, it needs a, a, a fast return. So that means that uh, in that context, we look for uh, the, the easy wins. And climate change, because of its complexity, uh, does not like to deal with the easy wins. Eh? Uh, you have to uh, continuously, with commitment, uh, work on it to see the benefit of it. It goes, you know, there's a type of slowness to this. So uh, third... Uh, we also like, and this is more or less copy-paste from the past, uh, look at our problems very single-focused. Uh, so we take a very single we look at the ec economy or environment, so social, we, in our infrastructure too. Eh? Uh, and that means that with less complex answers to these very wicked challenges, uh, uh, we invest in a world that therefore becomes more vulnerable. So... <laughs> Uh, vested interest, short term, uh, single focus, then you can say, oh, and then we are not so well organized. We're siloed up uh, in all our sectors, in our institutions, but also in the informal, non-institutional world. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of fragmentation and that actually, uh, again, has a, has a great connection to the, um, uh, to the vested interest. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps last, if we look at the ambitions, what we agreed upon, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals that form this amazing, inspiring, holistic, comprehensive, and inclusive agenda. Uh, if you re if you dare to read, I mean, their policy, I know it's United Nations language, but at the same time, if you just take a moment to uh, look through the language and see, whoa, this is a world that's equitable, that's about peace and justice, about women's rights and resilient cities and an amazing ocean and nature. So if you really uh, uh, take time to digest it, what happens, because these are 17 goals, mm. businesses, governments, NGOs, and so forth around the world go cherry picking. And they say, oh, we're very sustainable. I'll take SDG, mm. num sustainable development goal number one or two or three. And again, that leads to single focus solutions that fail in the context of this complexity. Mm -hmm. So... Some of the hurdles uh, to overcome means that we have to look at the challenges, not by looking back. Eh? So don't respond to the past, but look ahead. Mm. Look at it very comprehensively. So take social, economic, cultural, environmental, ecological, climate-related challenges mm -hmm. as a full agenda. Uh, come up with interventions, approaches first, eh, where with different partners, stakeholders, uh, uh, people uh, come with approaches that, that really look across these challenges. So bring everybody, but also everything uh, together. Try to make these connections. Uh, mm -hmm. And then look at the long term. 
Uh, but that's not easy. So I think to your question, uh, what are the most urgent challenges we need to address? Uh, I think uh, how can we overcome our vested interest? How can we shy away from investing in stupid infrastructure, eh? these siloed approaches yeah. uh, from the past? How can we really face this complexity face on and see that in that complexity lies the amazing solution? Eh? And we know it. Mm -hmm. We only have to do it. Um, and uh, uh, then from a financial point of view, also how can we validate uh, these type of intervention? And this is about, um, for example, if you invest in water, mm -hmm. your health costs go down. Uh, but the budget of a water agency or a water company or a water uh, uh, government organization is never connected to the budget of the health. The, on a political level, a water minister is never, uh, in, you know, in, la in sync uh, with his or her uh, colleague from the health department. So this is our siloed approach makes it very complex. But if you invest in water and you take time to look at it comprehensively, Mm -hmm. Then the revenues actually come in, and those are societal revenues, benefits mm -hmm. that benefit the society as a whole, and mm -hmm. are not per se only uh, financial. So, long answer, uh, but it's also very. Co I, mm -hmm. I also think it's. Comp I also see opportunities, of course, but we'll get there. Eh? Mm -hmm. So first, it's us. The biggest challenges challenge are we. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, it's not in our systems. It's not in uh, nature is part of the solution. Mm -hmm. We are still part of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> but indeed, like um, looking at uh, the kind of the, the answer you give, like I was kind of taking notes and it looks is, is literally a cultural problem to a certain extent. So there, there is the sciences, there are data. So is, we kind of have every all the ingredients, but uh, to the point that we don't change the culture, understanding how we can work together and be creative, I guess, in this environment. I think that still this is why people is the solution, but perhaps also the problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that cultural part is interesting uh, because uh, uh, since we're also are talking about design, uh, this is where the, uh, uh, not the solution comes from, but this is where the approach can come from that helps us build solutions that can you know, uh, uh, cha really uh, change course because we're, we're on the wrong track. Eh? Uh, and and you, you, you couldn't see it better perhaps than in the current pandemic and the, and the, the COVID-19, uh, everybody is affected uh, across the world um, and some are more vulnerable than others. And there, I'm, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more and how a pandemic actually relates to all the other challenges. So vulnerability gets a new meaning, mm -hmm. but let's, let's stick to the uh, response and the, uh, First, there is a Band-Aid response, very much looking at uh, aid, and then we look at recovery, especially in, in Europe, uh, 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 parts of Asia, uh, and the Americas. The recovery immediately focuses on the economy and jobs. Because mm -hmm. uh, because of the pandemic, our economy stalled. And we find this hard, hard to, to, to grasp it. Eh? You see unemployment, you see economic impacts. So what happens on a political level or also from an investment point of view is invest you know, economy first, jobs first. And then it all of a sudden doesn't matter where the money goes. Mm -hmm. Trillions around the world are ready to be spent on an economy. And what happens, and this is really scary, but this is exposing how vulnerable we are in the way we do things. We pick every project we can find off the shelf. Mm -hmm. What lies on the shelf old, outdated uh, opportunities, ones from the past, ideas from yesterday, mm. all infrastructure investments that make us more vulnerable. So mm. they provide jobs and a short-term economic recovery, but on the mid and the long-term make us much more vulnerable in the context of climate change and sustainable development. So what's happening around the world now is, before you know it, we have massive amounts of investment in our economy that instead of making us less vulnerable, which we can, eh, this is the best opportunity because we're spending like crazy uh, and, you, and, you know, 
And if we would do this in a design approach, we would, we, we would do this in the right way, but we don't. So we pick them off the shelf, all these stupid infrastructure investment. And before you know it, we're, we're, we're worse off than we ever thought we could be. Mm. So this is the big, mm. uh, I think the big challenge now is how can we really change course? How we can use all these investments? How can we show the world uh, that there are better opportunities? What is the alternative? And I yeah. think the responsibility is among everybody, of course, although we have political leadership and so forth and so forth. But it is interesting to look at it from a design and a designer's perspective to see what we can add. Can we help build that alternative narrative? Can we provide the world with a pipeline of investment opportunities that actually really are sustainable, that are comprehensive, that are connecting these dots and then including societies marginalized around the world uh, to build more sustainability? So I, I think this is where the opportunity lies. Mm -hmm. So I guess before I go to the next to the other question, I would like to invite uh, the participant. If you want to ask any question, you, you please do it because we can pick it up um, as we speak. So don't like feel free to ask ask question. But and coming back to the to the sign because you zoom in the word the sign is indeed what we like to understand is is literally you've been leading international projects and then like from the rebuilding as other hundreds and many others where you use water as a leverage and then using the sun in particular as a strategy and then perhaps if you can talk about what what's i mean what is what what do you see the sign here i mean also the meaning you put in the sign so what is a sort of level and then can you perhaps can you give us an example of how the sign can contribute to develop such economic transformations yeah i can try uh, it's not so easy again uh, but uh, uh, what i see uh, in my experience uh, over the past uh, decades, uh, working in, uh, in the world uh, uh, on these wicked challenges and, and problems is that uh, the moment you start to work with design, it's, uh, uh, it's the first part, it is twofold. Mm. One, it is about both the outcome uh, as well as about the process. So a design process is aimed at, uh, it's like uh, organizing. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. let's start with the outcome. Uh, design and the design approach is uh, often solution oriented. And of course, that is what we need. Eh? We need solutions for the challenges. Uh, design with that solution orientation is innovative, catalytic. Uh, so... There is this real transformational capacity that design brings, but there is this focus on so getting things done. Where yeah, We need to be able to do so. Second, uh, this solution orientation in this very innovative, transformative, and catalytic way is connected to the capacity of design, which is intrinsic, to connect. And that connectivity immediately ties into a compre the comprehensive needs. So if we have the 17 sustainable development goals, from a design perspective, you would immediately be able to identify interdependencies with these interdependencies, vulnerabilities, but also opportunities. So the capacity to connect from a design perspective is about scales, mm -hmm. yeah, from your backyard all the way to uh, a river delta transboundary. It's about time, eh? looking back, eh? cultural history, today, but also looking ahead with scenarios and so forth. But there's also this capacity to connect across challenges, needs, and interests. And this is interesting because uh, if we look at the challenges, as, as discussed before, they're, it, they're all connected. Uh, eh? And that means finding opportunities, how social, economic, environmental, ecological, and climate challenges relate. Mm -hmm. Design is the opportunity to make these connections. Second, organizations, people, institutions, non-institutions have different needs, but also different interests. Eh? Uh, one of the hurdles are vested interests. Overcoming vested interests is is by identifying the opportunities to connect these interests with each other. So create a common from a design perspective. Uh, and that same is with needs, eh? uh, local, uh, social uh, uh, needs or margin needs from marginalized communities or needs from 
uh, uh, communities in the context of war are different than needs from uh, uh, bigger stakeholders, uh, investors, or governments. So having the capacity to connect is critical importance, a key aspect. So we have solution orientation in its transformative capacity, but also the opportunity to connect. And then third, uh, uh, design and I call, I say design is political, but that is because there is this uh, capacity to aspire and inspire. So there, it's very, it helps on the ambition. It helps to set an agenda. It helps to drive for it also helps to communicate. It helps to address societal challenges in such a way that you can actually talk about them, not only from a passive point of view, but a very active. So the political capacity ties in the way in, in our uh, need for decision making. Mm -hmm. So solution orientation, the capacity to connect and this political part. If you look at it this way, then the, the, the second part is about this process. The design can help organize a process. Mm -hmm. It's a different conversation though, because, um, uh, but perhaps you want to elaborate on this. For, I don't. I'm not sure, but uh, happy to go on. Eh? So don't worry. Yeah. yeah. Now, actually, on this point, there is there is a question on the Q and A that, that per, perhaps links quite nicely to what you're talking about because it talks about. Um, if I can, if I'm reading the question, um, is from Alessandro Castorino. And the question is, is it possible the current designs proposed to improve the environment such as solar panels could have any backfire and put us in a worse position than before? So I guess it's more kind of the science. Yeah, it's, so, yeah, yeah, Alessandro, you're right in the sense that uh, if these design efforts come from past perspectives and the only thing we do is replicate and bring them to scale without acknowledging that the context and the challenges change, mm -hmm. we indeed become more vulnerable. But if we can uh, put design in the context of future challenges and really help us drive ambition, but also uh, inform solutions that are transformative, catalytic, sustainable, and look at that future, then design is part of the solution. So here is also the choice. Eh? Is it about solving the problems from the past in a single focused way and then replicate and scaling them up across the world? And we're lost. Eh? Uh, but uh, if the, the design capacity uh, is used in the context of our future challenges, then it's exactly the opposite. So it's also a choice eh? uh, to mm -hmm. uh, Laura's point in the beginning, is it natural or human? Uh, and the biggest challenges lie with uh, humanity, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So sometimes the sign might be part of the problem to a certain extent, in the sense that yeah. you know, if there is there is a, it has to be an, an acknowledgement of con the conditions. So you're not just a designer; it's part of of a brief, or you've been given some skills or tools. But the, there is a more complex environment that you have to be aware of. Yeah, and there comes a um, um, uh, an ethical question. Yeah. Um, so suppose the designer can actually do what I just said, eh? help develop solutions that are catalytic, understand the full complexity of uh, our challenges in its capacity to connect and digest this complexity and the capacity of uh, moving this forward in a political way. Then, in the, also in the context of Alessandro's question and your question, uh, is the ethical question, what is, it, does a designer and then does the design community have a choice uh, by bringing forward these past solutions that make us more vulnerable or by uh, activating, uh, being more activistic, activating society by bringing forward their assessments and opportunities that actually help us change course. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore, and that is an ethical question in itself. Uh, of course, eh? do we replicate our mistakes from the past or do we help uh, provide opportunities for the future? But we have to be careful. It's not only about outcome. It is also about process. And here comes the, the that second perspective. Uh, a lot of research being done uh, 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 around the world on uh, how, how how you can how you can define process. I uh, uh, in I I'm in my words. I always say that. You have to create like uh, enough room for collaboration, eh? uh, um, but also uh, a, like a parallel process out of the institutional lock-in we often find ourselves in. Eh? You 
rebuilt by design, as you mentioned, as an example, also was, uh, uh, was not isolated, but it was separated in a way that it was parallel to all these institutional uh, uh, worlds, but it, it was well connected. So collaboration mm-hmm. means that you ensure these connections, but at the same time, you create uh, a, enough room uh, for safety because yeah. in society there's a lot of distrust among you know against government or investors or communities or left or right or uh, up top and down and so forth um, so design can really help create an environment for collaboration participation inclusion uh, as we say mm-hmm. and that that safe space in literature, sometimes called soft space, uh, yeah. is where we can come together. Uh, and based on uh, uh, on coming together, uh, uh, finding an opportunity to bring different voices together, different mm-hmm. interests, different needs, uh, that capacity of design, of helping to develop such a process is critical and important. Mm-hmm. Of course, it's connected to what outcomes are, because the designers can then help inspire such a process, but ensuring such a safe space uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's crit- is critical and important. Mm-hmm. I guess, like, um, because uh, the first question I prepared, you kind of already addressed it, which was about capacity. The basic means you, this is the role of the designer, like it's a biological question. And it comes back to the idea that do we have capacity to develop this transformation, therefore, and it's not what we need to actually develop. Um, as a skills to actually be part of the system and be contributors of, of developing opportunities and transformations. Yeah, I, I'm a true believer that we have, uh, uh, and I also see it in the, uh, in the uh, programs I help develop or develop myself, uh, that if only we do it, we can. And it, it's very simple, and I don't want to oversimplify it, but uh, it really is... Uh, true that the moment um, you uh, it's like, like uh, I, I started a new program in Asia mm-hmm. it's called water as leverage using water as an enabler for sustainable development also as a catalyst mm-hmm. uh, in a way it's a metaphor because it uh, really looks across the sustainable development goals and water therefore really is you know, investing in water has a trickle-down effect for better health, more inclusion, better education, a better economy, more biodiversity or less biodiversity loss, mitigation, mitigate climate, uh, but also adapt and so forth and so forth. So water has this capacity. But the program was a design-driven uh, program, and it was really about uh, bringing communities, institutions, experts uh, in three cities in Asia together. And uh, what happened, based on uh, that ambition and uh, a continuous effort of all, of ensuring that inclusion was not only the middle name of the process, but was a culture, uh, participation was not only a word, but a culture, uh, and so forth, and so forth. That, 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 and this is the question, are we, it's not the capacity, it's, it's the will, because the outcomes of water as leverage are amazing. Uh, and if we, you know, we're doing one pilot now, we're investing in 27 projects in, over the next years, but we start this year with a pilot and then we scale it up. If we really it can do it in Chennai, India, Kuma, Bangladesh, and Samarum in Indonesia, we can do it in London, in Amsterdam, in New York. We can do it uh, in Dushanbe, in, 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 no, it doesn't really matter where. Uh, so it's not a matter of capacity, it's a matter of will, uh, of organizing, and again, goes back to your first question, mm-hmm. what are the hurdles? Uh, and I think, to be very honest, the biggest hurdle is vested interest, and mm-hmm. the lack of the willingness for all of us around the world to mm-hmm. really change. Uh, this comes nicely, connects nicely with a question we have in the chat, which talks about speculative design. So the idea of, of design to actually design narratives about the future. And then the question is, how does speculative design play into picking up cohesive destruction projects? And can you give us an example of a lens to, to help evaluate whether we are picking a cohesive project and, and not an old world problem uh, from the chef, as, as mentioned before? 
Yeah, so um, two questions have really, uh, and the speculative design plan to picking up cohesively structured projects. Well, I, I hope I explained it a bit, but I, 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 I do think, well, uh, it was an example in Chennai uh, with the Water with Leverage program uh, where the thousand tanks team uh, led by Ooze Architects and 30 organizations from Chennai and across the world uh, uh, helped one start to digest what the problem was. So what is the real problem when it comes to water? And in Chennai, they, there is an abundance of water, but it only falls in a short amount of time. And the uh, natural water body systems were either polluted or frag fragmented or overcrowded or uh, urbanized. Uh, the groundwater was exploited and uh, actually also polluted. Uh, and Chennai as a city, you know, uh, as you know, growing so rapidly has a hardened surface. So what happens on when it rains, everything floods and it immediately flows to the ocean. Um, but the need for fresh water provision for humans, for industry, food, and so forth, is only increasing because that, the demand is only increasing. So Chennai is building desalination plants. And a desalination plant is, a, a you, know, you could say, a factory that takes the salt out of the ocean water well, and cleans it so you can use it. But it takes up a lot of energy, and that energy is all uh, coal and uh, oil-based, uh, so fossil-based. Uh, <laughs> and these plants are next to the ocean. So you not only have to use up a lot of energy to produce water you can use, you also have to pump it through the system or truck it to the system. So it's like a triple effect of uh, uh, fossil fuel-driven uh, water provision. While on the on the basis of the full year, there's enough water, if only nature could do its trick. So what did the team do was really working with the community, with uh, the businesses, with investors, with government stakeholders to redo uh, those systemic failures in how the city is built up by investing in nature, uh, opening up, uh, existing water tanks and water ponds, uh, creating more opportunities along the canals and the rivers, feeding the water back into the aquifer, so the groundwater, making sure it was clean, so the groundwater was recharged with clean water. And then you can use it and reuse it in such a way that those nature-based solutions sequester carbon by itself, but they also, uh, and we, you know, Jenna now does not need to build these very expensive, large, uh, fossil fuel driven diesel plant. So there is a cut on costs. Mm -hmm. So a third less investment and half of the cost in maintenance and operation. But there's a massive cut on carbon. And of course, the city becomes more healthy in, in the times of uh, a pandemic, critical important. And there's water provision for all at every day. So yes, uh, um, uh, and how did we then evaluate these projects uh, to make sure that that comprehensive approach uh, really started to tick all the boxes? We used the sustainable development goals. Uh, uh, so we used those goals, those 17 goals, to see how those investments actually contribute to a healthy society, an inclusive society that, uh, that was looking more uh, not only at environmental challenges, but across. Mm -hmm. The second, we looked at how uh, uh, the Paris Agreement actually acknowledges. Yeah, so, look, if you if you look at climate change impacts, uh, we you can actually evaluate how these investments actually uh, you know, help us mitigate climate risks, but also mitigate climate change. So, there mm -hmm. are ways to address uh, uh, solutions that are more comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Then again, that is not easy. So uh, you have to take the effort to invest in the process of engaging uh, with scientists, uh, economists, uh, governments, uh, experts, uh, marginalized communities, and bring that knowledge uh, uh, to the table to be able to validate what you do. And this is not only 
an economics or expert level validation. This is also about the indi indigenous uh, knowledge, uh, <laughs> a cultural validation that is critical important. <laughs> and and I, I think, hope, oh sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, go. Yeah. No, if you keep going, if you interrupt, if you, I thought if, uh, we're done. No, no, I think, I think uh, we more or less try to answer for these uh, questions. Because on this point, the other question actually looks back at exactly what you're talking about now, um, which is, um, do you think that government institutional um, bureaucracy and silent encourages myopic vested solution? Or following on, uh, do you think that private funding is a better place to inspire positive international change? Or perhaps is focused on disrupting and monopolizing in industries? Algae, algae. I'm not sure how I uh, pronounce your first name, but uh, um, uh, also again, it's not that simple. Um, uh, uh, governments around the world agreed on the Sustainable Development Goals as a holistic, comprehensive agenda. So intrinsically, uh, governments are not uh, uh, aimed at a siloed approach. Same goes for businesses. Yeah. Uh, businesses that do pledge yeah, to deliver on some of the SDGs do not per se do this to make the world more vulnerable. Yeah. And so it's not that there is, uh, uh, that the world is bad and everybody uh, is uh, by uh, intrinsic qualities driving the world towards disaster. But it's often hard to escape your vested interests or your habits from the past. It is on a very small personal level already true. Uh, uh, you know, we all celebrated blue skies in the spring. Uh, business travel is still down, but tourist travel is, you know, back up. Okay. And so is this a, a private sector business or government driven problem or is it also a personal challenge uh, to change uh, course. Changing courses are always hard. Eh? Shying away for doing the wrong thing, or, you know, what is then wrong? So uh, so it's, it's not that easy. I do think that in the partnership between public, private, informal and institutional lie the solutions. Because if you bring the different uh, uh, partners, uh, organizations, people together, you can try to set up a conversation where everybody starts to bring uh, some of the opportunities to that same table. And the more you get to the table, the more you can start to create a common that is, uh, is more solid than only when you say, okay, I follow company A or government B, because they only have a certain amount of interest and a certain amount of needs. And the more complexity, the better. Uh, so uh, answering your question one-off, one organization will never bring salvation. Uh, it's impossible. Uh, there is no one organization that has the capacity to look at everything, bring it all together, and drive solutions across the board. And mm -hmm. that is why collaboration and inclusion are so critical and important. So... Uh, and, and then there are many organizations around the world that want to add value. So, and they can be drivers for change. Mm -hmm. We have to continue to bring them together with the ones that have a harder time of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, last, yes, private sector is very much placed, well placed to help us drive that forward. It should not, uh, it does, will definite, salvation will definitely not come from a government alone but also not come from private sector at all. It is really about partnerships. Mm -hmm. I think in this idea of participant, there is also the other, the next question, which is how do we create a safe environment to collaboration and design? And when we are so, why we're so attached to all values like ACC investment, how to overcome our fears to lose the, the uh, work we know, I guess. The world we know. The world. Yeah, uh, yeah. so Chris, uh, you're very much right. That is not easy. And I have no, um, uh, uh, so I have no, there is no silver bullet uh, for that. You have to uh, uh, try it. Uh, when I was working for President Obama after Hurricane Sandy in New York, 
um, uh, the first thing we came across when we started Rebuild by Design and trying to bring communities together with governments and others was, uh, we don't trust you because you're the government. So uh, at that moment in time, it was very easy to have said, okay, then we do it without you. Or in some communities, uh, it took us months uh, to uh, build up a level of collaboration, which is not the same as a level of trust. Yeah. In some communities where Sandy really hit hard and the government was very late and the money did not come or the challenges were very, you know, political as well as uh, environmental and societal, um, it, it did not come easy. So we brought all these teams to these communities. They worked in soup kitchens across the, we let them work with, uh, NGOs that really challenged the government, um, let the government agency be part of that, challenge the government from the design perspective and the communities at the same time. So this was a continuous investment of every minute of every day, uh, investing in this process of collaboration. And, and based on that, there was a, uh, a level of understanding, yeah? so the challenges were better understood, vulnerability among communities were better understood, yeah? that it was not only the government, but also climate change that made them more vulnerable, and that it was not only climate change, but also their social as well as physical condition, and that, you know, working together, we could help improve those baselines of societal uh, vulnerability, uh, and that we were able to expand on those very first careful steps of building trust. Uh, there were, of course, optimistic stories to share and pessimistic stories to share. I'll share an optimistic one is that a year later, when we presented the first batch of uh, opportunities to an international jury, uh, one of the key stakeholders of uh, one of the programs uh, coming out of Rebuild by Design was a uh, Afro-American woman, Damaris Reyes, who leads uh, the 30 plus organizations on the Lower East Side. So this is vulnerable community from a societal perspective, but also vulnerable physical to uh, climate change. And she said to the jury, uh, rebuild by design, and I quote her, rebuild by design made us sit on the same side of the table. So she acknowledged there was this opportunity by creating trust in the process, you know, safety, uh, openness, uh, inclusion, that she felt that she, with her community and her community organization, were on the same side. And then one of the jury members said, ah, uh, who had experience in New York, said, well, you know, that was different in my time. And she immediately responded and said, but we can easily sit back on the other side again. And there is a saying in the Netherlands um, uh, that trust comes by turtle but leaves by horse. And, and, you know, I'm just directly translating this from Dutch, so forgive me. But it means it takes massive amount of time and investment in each other to build up little trust that continues to be fragile, but you can easily break it. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I like it. Mm -hmm. It would be crazy if we would all trust each other. Huh? Not in this world. So putting in rigorous amount of energy, capacity, effort every day is the best thing we can do. Right? It's the most, it, um, it's the most rewarding part. If these things come easy, distrust the outcomes. Yeah? Working hard by investing, it doesn't matter if it's a relationship uh, or a design process. You invest in each other. Why? Because it's the most beautiful thing there is to do. And only by sticking to that promise, uh, there is the opportunity that you come out better together. Uh, but if you say, oh, you know, I just want a one-off uh, uh, and uh, I'll do it cheap, then forget about it. So how to overcome our fears? I don't know. Um, uh, um, and I, um, my parents passed away lo uh, quite a while ago. Uh, my father was an architect. Uh, his father was an architect and his grandfather were architects. 
Um, so well, he was an engineer architect, solu- very solution oriented, but only by people. But my mother was an activist, uh, first female school director post World War II in the Netherlands, uh, east of the Netherlands, uh, always working with migrants, uh, children, setting up NGOs and so forth and so forth. She had the motto of leaving no one behind written in our heart. And that was that, you know, we were always about. And they, they always gave me the belief uh, until their last days uh, that there was a perspective if only you invest in people. And then with my father's capacity, you know, his solution orientation, investing in people to drive solutions that can help drive change bringing people together. So I think overcoming your fears is by collaboration. Uh, and uh, uh, that is not easy, but it, as said, uh, inclusion, radical inclusion, I say in my book, uh, critical, important, but also the, the, the best thing uh, that uh, you can have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I, I think in the sort of kind of alignment, there is also the, the other question, which is about, you mentioned the Chennai water issue, the, their problem, unfortunately, is man-made. It is a lack of coordination between various government agencies. And how can you change the structure of problem with the same thinking approach? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the problem is not only uh, that there is a lack of coordination between various governments. I wish it was true. And the only thing we need to solve is the government. But the problem is very much, I, you know, I've been working in Chennai for quite a bit. Uh, the problem is across society. It's with businesses that pollute or invest in the wrong stuff. It's with individual people in well, uh, um, um, uh, people with money and people without the capacity that pollute too. There is a a lack of understanding of this water challenge across institutional and informal world. And Jena is not the only city in the world. And we lack that understanding in Europe, in the Americas, in parts in Asia and Africa too. Uh, so uh, fragmentation, as said, vested interest, uh, focused on uh, quick wins are big challenges. So, uh, the, the, there is a structural problem in society that uh, that type of fragmentation and a lack of that understanding is happening. So building up an awareness and understanding is critical, important. And doing this in a collaborative, inclusive way is even better because it helps create an enabling environment and helps build capacity up on which it is possible to try to overcome these vested interests. Um, so, uh, and yes, it is man-made. I mean, this is where we started from. Uh, uh, we created the world we're in now, we're living in now. We can also create a world where living in is much better, where the future is much better. So it's on us to change course. Um, now, the structural government problem change it with design, change it with design thinking. It's possible uh, if only you don't try to solve it only within the government. Yeah? Government is there for a need. Uh, yeah? Politicians often respond to cries of pain out of society. Uh, if you bring on the two, the, the, the different sides together, government, private sector, investors, community, uh, community boards, informal and institutional capacity, it is possible to try to build a type of understanding, awareness, acknowledgement. But with design thinking, also pathways forwards, opportunities to invest, mitigating problems and seeing opportunities that help us adapt and become more resilient. So it's the two sides. eh? Uh, You bring it together and you show the alternative. and I think with, um, uh, again, with Chennai, the immediate response based on the need was, again, single-focused solutions. Eh? Uh, 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 um, desalination plants, uh, but with, when it rains, Chennai floods. Eh? So there's drought and floods at the same time often. 
I was in Chennai, well, uh, not after March, but uh, one experience was last year where we were in the middle of the drought. Eh? So the newspapers around the world said Chennai is drying up. And the train with water, they trained in water, uh, with, they brought in water with a train uh, to provide citizens, mm-hmm. businesses uh, with what? The day the train entered the city of Chennai, or in that week, the city flooded because of rain even. So you had this crazy experience. I could not leave the office of the chief uh, Chennai uh, commissioner because uh, the streets were flooded, but nobody had water. Uh, And this is because the system is broke. Overcoming this is by bringing in this design capacity to come up with solutions that are catalytic, connect across needs, interests, skills, times, and cultures, uh, uh, and build awareness and capacity uh, mm-hmm. among society in a way that you can help build trust. Small steps. Yeah. Uh, I guess um, before, like, um, we invite um, the, the participant to ask more questions before we hit into the closure of, of the session. Like I, I would like to ask you, like, we talk about a lot about collaboration and then the sun has different kinds of shades between our con process and political. So I guess what if, if you can, that is, is, is there any sort of ideal stakeholder system uh, that is sort of like the character that they play together and actually a combination of those can actually make the difference by kind of, and what design and where design is in this sort of stakeholder system? Is there an idea? Well, I I think you can guess that I will say no, eh? (laughs) that there is no ideal situation. Uh, And I think this also is um, uh, because all our cultures are different. So you really have to be very adaptive, uh, uh, agile. Uh, I don't know what words you want to use, but every place is different. If you work in Chile, it's different than when you work in Peru and they're on the same continent. And then it's different than Argentina or Brazil. So if I would work, I, you know, I work in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Europe, the Americas. So there is a, mm-hmm. there's a, 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 you know, a cultural difference, a historical difference, a political, societal, economic, uh, but there are also difference in the challenges. Uh, vulnerabilities are different. Look at the pandemic. Uh, Africa has an average age of uh, 19.2. So totally uncomparable with Europe. Uh, vulnerability to this pandemic is uh, totally different. Uh, but there are parts of Africa that are so vulnerable because of droughts, migration, uh, terrorism, conflicts, uh, biodiversity de- degradation, that the pandemic is just the last hit for these communities. Uh, so while in Europe, it's just one hit. Eh? We're pretty okay when it comes to preparedness. And then we're still, uh, the pandemic hits us hard. But in the places where all these crises are already are happening, eh? a gender gap, uh, no uh, water and sanitation, uh, um, uh, mm-hmm. fragility because of climate, fragility because of migration or conflicts or both. Then a pandemic, and then you see societies break. Uh, not because they're vulnerable to this to this one question, but because their vulnerability is across all these challenges. So mm-hmm. there is no holy grail to a process. Mm-hmm. There is no holy grail to uh, uh, design capacity, but there are, of course, aspects uh, that you can take into account. Human habitat. Uh, the UN uh, Urban Program um, uh, developed a, a planning and design manual for uh, development and design in cities from across the world. You can uh, download it from their page. They list examples on how you can do better from a design approach. It's actually a good guide. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I, you know, we um, evaluated rebuild by design. Uh, we just are in the mid, in finalizing the evaluation of water as leverage in Asia. Uh, uh, we will share that information immediately on the Rebuild by Design website. You can see mm-hmm. numerous uh, parts of research. So 
we tried to uh, talk about it, write about it. I wrote a book about my experience in rebuild by design, but the middle, you know, what you can find out of that is that tailor made, uh, as long as you stick to the principles of inclusion, integration, look at the future, dare to be innovative, uh, uh, transparent, focus on people, uh, and the process, the enabling environment. Uh, 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 and uh, I always uh, add to that continuity, consistency, and commitment are critical important. And we, you know, we like to pilot hop around the world. We do a project here and then there and then there and then there. We think, oh, look at this, all these beautification of the world, but it won't get us uh, to a more sustainable situation. Eh? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and driving sustainable development is, is, is well, and demands continuity, consistency, and commitment uh, from all. So, uh, uh, and the, the design approach can help eh? uh, uh, mm-hmm. in that, uh, to that level. Yeah. Now, I guess, like, uh, drawing this session towards the end, because you started to list this word, process, people, continuity, consistency, like, if you want to have a sort of takeaways from this evening um, talk, uh, something that the participant with us can take with them to reflect more and per- perhaps start to contribute in the system, what do you think this can be? Um, that, oh, pff, that's a good question. Um, that, um, I think not, so one is the current pandemic, uh, and because this, there is a real opportunity now because, uh, uh, governments and private sector are spending massive amounts of money in our society. And design and a design approach can really help, uh, change course. So, uh, trying to find in your, uh, uh, uh context, uh, in your cities, communities, with your government, with your the, uh, people that invest, with small businesses and so forth. Finding opportunities to help change course is going to be critical, important, because everything you invent now in the context of the current situation has the opportunity to be, to, uh, to, to be picked up and replicate and, uh, and get to scale. So whatever we do right now, will have a ripple effect. So please uh, work with me. Second, um, uh, uh, be an activist. Uh, uh, so uh, don't be shy. Uh, it, there, there's, there are no need for shyness now, but in the context of what you see happening in these investments, in these opportunities, speak up, uh, organize, uh, Produce alternatives. Uh, show that there are different or better ways forward where uh, these investments, the, these practices can go. And you have the, uh, the, the world as your partner. We agreed on sustainable development goals. We agreed on the Paris Agreement. But we have a hard time relating to the solutions that belong to these agreements. Mm-hmm. So help us build pipelines of sustainable projects and interventions, no matter at what scale, no matter where you are or live. Uh, I really think that from this activist uh, uh, perspective, uh, you can contribute. And don't forget, there is this, this helps. It really helps. Eh? There is an opportunity to change course now. Um, I'm not saying we never had an opportunity. We we always have opportunities. But now in the context of these pandemics and changes we see happening around the world, uh, uh, the challenge also is the opportunity. Uh, uh, Ram Emanuel and others said never waste a good crisis or a crisis is a bad thing to waste or whatever you want to quote him. It sounds easy and cheap. It is not easy, but it is also not cheap. Uh, the, the opportunity we have now to do things for the better is there, but we're not doing it. Uh, Bloomberg uh, uh, News, as well as others, research that on the trillions that are now being made ready to be spent on the recovery, I think only 0.4% goes to sustainable projects. And it's scary. And I'm not saying that you can easily change those 99.6%, but I bet you can, you know, together we can change one, 
And then from one, we can change five. And from five, we can change 25%. And the moment we get there, uh, the curve starts to change. So yes, we can change course. Don't mm -hmm. forget. Uh, thank you very much for, for kind of closing this sort of positivistic way, which, you know, it's not about giving answers. It's about kind of activating us and we, we are part of the system. We are part of this. We are, we are in this planet and understanding that actually we can make a difference is our responsibility. So it's not something that we can see. This is a problem that belongs to somebody else, but it's also looking from our perspective, from our disciplines, from our activities, what, what we can do to actually kind of uh, like embody our responsibilities and, and act and then be part of, of, of the change that is possible it's just kind of as we've discussed so far in this evening the culture and we didn't talk about resilience in a sense but it's literally this idea of, of being able to bounce back and then and respond to what happens and just to kind of yeah and, and, and just one thing to add to that eh, uh, before we close it eh, um, bouncing back is also a little bit uh, stupid resiliency I don't know if there's actually this definition <laughs> Uh, but the capacity to learn, if you can incorporate this in bouncing back, mm -hmm. then we really uh, will do better. Mm -hmm. yeah? Learning from what's happening, learning from the past, the good and the mistakes, but also learning in this aspect of bouncing back mm -hmm. adds a layer to resiliency and redundancy that really is about adaptivity, flexibility, but also about making connections and this learning capacity. I think, again, from a design perspective, assessing needs, assessing challenges, assessing interdependencies, mm -hmm. assessing vulnerabilities helps us drive awareness, uh, uh, build uh, mm -hmm. understanding and capacity and adds to how can we see opportunities that are catalytic, transformative, comprehensive and inclusive and i think in this context the designers can really 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 inspire yeah. us all yes it's just kind of it's brilliant to understand bouncing as a learning less so it's yeah. the idea this is totally human so we we are designing to do that uh, even though we're not kind of design but designers in particular so thank you very much for the very fascinating talk we had this evening. It's been a, a great, a great, a very interesting, a inspiring. I mean, it's been inspiring me. So I'm sure the, the, the audience has been here, like at the same time, thinking, coming back home and then thinking about being home, I'm afraid, <laughs> and thinking back uh, what happened this evening. Uh, so we have been also people, thank you, Hank, on the, on the chat. So, and somebody. Thanks, Laura. Thanks so much. Well, very oh, good. Yeah. So uh, I pass the word back to, to Beth. Uh, I was going to conclude this session. Thank you. Laura and Hank, thank you so much uh, for both sharing your thoughts and expertise. And thank you to everyone who joined us for today's in-session talk. If you have any additional questions or would like to connect directly with the executive education team and all the speakers, please use the contact information on this slide. Please follow us on social media at RCA Short Courses on Twitter and Instagram. And make sure to check out our event, uh, our event web page for upcoming in-session talks and how to register for free. Thank you for your time, everyone, and goodbye.